Well, it's funny. I was I, I, a stack of notebooks a foot high from the day I began. And I, I originally did have nine, nine stories and they all had vague, very vague elements of what wound up in the book. But, um, but they went through, they went through such a journey, each story, they went, they all turned into very, very, very different things. And then when I finally, uh, executed them at the end, they kind of came back more to the initial spark. And it really, is, you know, I always think of that corny uh, metaphor of, you know, of like carrying a, a lit match through a wind tunnel, you know, as people talk about that in making a movie, because there's just so much shit that can destroy it. And it really had that feeling of like carrying this little spark of inspiration, which is um, things that, that, that are interesting or compelling to me that I can't explain you know, little things of each story that had elements to them that I was just couldn't stop thinking about, but I didn't know why exactly. And carrying that kind of, uh, energized mystery through to the end is, uh, that's something I felt like I, I achieved, which it it, often by the end, you're, you've moved on from that initial spark. When you say you can't explain it, you mean from the standpoint of you can't explain why they stayed with you, or you actually can't explain the phenomenon described in the story? No, no. The story I try to make is as kind of pointed and specific as possible as to getting across that mysterious feeling. Like I'm trying to transmit that feeling to other people. And, and so the execution is all about kind of precision and density and and all that but the but the the thing that i'm describing is something i could i couldn't put into words i always feel like if i could just put it into words that's probably not what i want to be spending seven years on then you would put it into words i would just put it it would be okay (laughs) i really appreciate that and that that's something that um it's something i think about a lot with regards to movies and it sounds like you have you're very much in that mental space too as far as to a certain degree contextualizing some of the art that you make as as films and it's always that i i i i just recently watched uh miller's crossing on the like 30 millimeter like yeah like old print and 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 that's the thing about the coen brothers that gets me every time is it's just it's just a, it's a feeling. It's a feeling that you can't describe, and that that makes my job really hard. <laughs> you know, it's there's there's something there's something ineffable ineffable about that. That's why art criticism is so difficult and suspect. And you find the best art critics kind of get they feel something, but they don't know how they they talk around it often. I think miss attributed to. I will Costello, but the, the dancing about architecture thing that he talked about. Right. Um, the, yeah, so I'm going to keep pulling from this, uh, Wapo story, but I, I think there was a lot of, um, really interesting things about there. Um, it was, um, I think, it, oh, uh, aloneness and abandonment are the two words that were described. We're using that piece to describe that. I mean, are those, are those two of the, pervasive feelings in this book for you yeah though i i didn't necessarily set out to to do that in in the beginning but once i was finished i went not finished finished but sort of finished with the conceptual part of it i went through it and i was like what what is this and i and i kind of noted that it was kind of nine different variations on aloneness you know, they're all, they're all about that, but all in, in different ways and different, different forms. But that's, that's sort of the, and I think that's sort of the running thesis of, of my work. Like modern isolation is kind of, it's a big thing. Yeah. I think in a lot of these pieces, it's, you know, a constant in, in, in human life, certainly in modern life, but it is something that really has been drawn into sharp focus for a lot of people over the past three years for pretty obvious reasons. I think it's funny. I feel, I see all these articles about, about like urban loneliness. And I was like, you know, it's like, Oh, everybody caught up to me. (laughs) 
I was doing this in 1980. You know, it's like, I, I remember one here. It is a weird thing about being in the city. You know, I'm in New York now and it is a weird thing about being surrounded by people and still feeling lonely. And, and I've actually, no, I, that was where I was the most lonely I've ever been in my life was when I lived in New York in the, in the early eighties when I had my own place and I just felt like you'd walk the streets, just like, how do I get out of this? You know, it really felt very taxi driver ish. It ended better for you. Thankfully. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I keep coming back to their radio and I'm wondering if that imagery was something that existed from the outset. To me, that's something that you can really sink your teeth into. And that is something that is a bit of a constant throughout the book. That radio, I drew uh, the radio that my own grandma had, which she took with her everywhere on every trip. It was this kind of German fancy radio. I'm not sure why she bought that particular one. It was very, uh, she was not somebody who'd buy like the latest German technology. Probably not then too. I mean, I don't know what decade it was. The two probably. But, um, but after she died, I found it, I found like, oh, this radio is because she had the radio on all day. It was always in Chicago. She listened to news radio 78. And so it was like, you know, news on the top of the hour all day. And then she'd switch it over to kind of music. And so those two things were just the soundtrack of my entire life with her. And, uh, and so I, uh, I felt it, it was some connection to that. Like I felt like that was the voice of, of this like person I wished I could still communicate. You still have the radio? You know, I, I had it and then I decided it was unhealthy to keep it. So I got rid of it. <laughs> I, I, I had it in my hand and then I, I actually just threw it in a dumpster. I felt like a, that's, I've got to do that because I just imagined my son one day, like, what am I going to do? What is this old radio? You know, I don't want to burden anybody else. It's unhealthy from the standpoint of just having old junk or or the sort of the what was projected yeah, on like it. the connection. Just just to like have that feeling every time I see it, like, oh my grandma, you know, it's I I don't I don't wanna exacerbate that. I have enough of that already. <laughs> yeah, if you can avoid generational trauma. Is probably <laughs> and, and I absolutely <laughs> no. can't. So, yeah. You know, you, you can you can <laughs> cut down on it I here and there. Yeah, no, I, I've got a lot more generational trauma than than a radio. I'm afraid. I think about this a lot. I think about the radio. You know, my my interactions with radio uh, when I was younger, and there's something. It connects really closely to this conversation around, you know, isolation, modern isolation, loneliness of flipping through the dial and, you know, a voice comes through and, you you know, you don't really know where it comes from. Yeah, it's it's uh, well, and the, the the thing I liked in that story was the the idea that's that I remember very clearly from my childhood is getting the exact place to get reception. So you'd walk around with a radio antenna around the house trying to listen to a baseball game or something and it was crackling and then you'd hold it like in the middle of the room, like, okay, I can hear it right now. You know, and it was very, uh, I spent a lot of time in rural Michigan with my grandparents where there was no nearest radio station was across the lake. And so the wind's blowing one way or something's going on and you couldn't get any reception. And I remember, I remember, you know, sitting in the backyard with the radio, just sort of barely able to hear anything. And there's something so, uh, compelling and magical about that. Like you were in the spot, you know, and that spot was loaded with some kind of uh, juju, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was really interesting. For me, the other aspect of that is, and I think this really relates to the story is not knowing whether you'll ever hear that voice again. Yeah. And that idea of if you had this connection like that, would you, um, you know, would you give up your whole life for it? Because that's kind of that's kind of the equation. Because she loses a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. I used to work for a, a website called Engadget, and we would do a video show, and sure. um, we we did a Halloween special, and and we were uh, hanging out with a bunch of ghost hunters. We went up to New England, and if, I don't know if you've watched any of the ghost hunting shows. I wasn't super. Oh, for sure. okay. Well, so you'll know that like most of the equipment that they use are just like off the shelf. It's like a Radio Shack radio. Right. And that's a that's a super interesting way to think about communication with the dead. 
Yeah, it's the only way we can process that idea. Like there's some vibration that they can speak to us on. I always loved in the old uh, in the old DC comics the idea of the Phantom Zone, where they send criminals up and they're just all they're all just watching us <laughs> as ghosts. That's so horrible. It's such a such a cruel punishment. Like it's worse than you know solitary confinement. It's just, it's absolutely monstrous and and it's uh it, but it's so haunting as a kid i really was like you know are these is uh you know is lex luthor staring at me right now i'm curious what the kind of the impetus of the uh 60s cult stuff was in here i mean to me that's sort of really the most fascinating storyline it felt it felt uh right for the for the world of today somehow it felt like it felt very uh very much how it feels to just exist in public in 2023, I think, where everybody is in a cult, basically. You know, not to put too fine a point on it, but the character, I don't want to say the character is your mother, but she's fairly strongly inspired by your mother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to a point where you were, you were worried about her reading this book. Yeah. Yeah. I felt, it, it's funny. I had, I felt very courageous doing this. I was like, I've got to just do this book as, as I imagine it. And I was sort of hoping I could just keep it from her. Cause it's not like she reads publishers weekly, you know, she uh, read, she, uh, you know, she would not have necessarily known about it, but she did have friends who were, who were like bookstore mavens and they would have probably told her, I'm not sure she would have, read it if I didn't give her a free copy. But still, just the idea of of her and my brother reading it was uh I knew it was going to be unpleasant. And so and so I kind of lucked out that she she and my brother both died. Jesus Christ, it, Dan. <laughs> it was a lucky break. So you you think that even without telling her she would implicitly recognize things in this character? <laughs> yeah, it would have been pretty clear. And so far as you're comfortable talking about it, what what aspects influenced Monica? Um, just uh, just sort of deal, like dealing with her aftermath. You know, she she died kind of early on in the making of the book, and left a real uh, catastrophe behind her, both emotionally and and actually. <laughs> and so. Uh, and so just sort of realizing, kind of coming to grips with who she was uh, in an honest way was, was uh, it was very therapeutic in a way to deal with it. I'm not sure it, it uh, helped me in a therapeutic way, but it, it was, uh, it was, it gave me a lot to think about. It was, you know, I, I always felt like I had a childhood that was, so indescribable that I've never, I, I never met anybody who, who I, you know, people meet each other and they go, Oh, I was born in, in uh, Cleveland and my dad worked at this factory. And I went and you go, Oh, I was too. And I, I have this connection, but I had such a bizarre family that I can't, I've never met anybody that, that after a few minutes of talking about our families, they don't go like, I don't know what you're, I have no idea what you're talking what, about. What planet did you grow up on? Yeah. So it's always that that was sort of the key to my isolation, I think, as a kid. I don't know really anything about your early life. Maybe for good reason. Yeah, no, it's I mean, it was just very, it was incredibly complicated. And, um, you know, my my parents were into auto racing. They were um, they were sort of amateur formula junior auto racers my dad built a car and my mom was he because they were not happy together he kind of taught her how to become a mechanic and help him on his car so they had a hobby and then she wound up dumping him for their driver their, who was driving in races divorced him when i was two and then he died in a crash in a race when i was five and so and then she just spiraled out from there so that was that's like that's just part of a tiny part of it mm -hmm. sort of the basic you know 
Hollywood through line. Well, I mean, you realize, I don't know, maybe you're too close to it, but you realize that that's a good plot line for a movie or a book or something. That's a pretty incredible story. Yeah, no, yeah, but yeah it, I mean, it is, it is. Um, and, uh, and so it, it was just a very, uh, it was a very isolated childhood. Like I had, I was kind of dealing, dealing with that on my own and to have a mother who was just sort of checked out from, from that age. Uh, you know, it was it, it, like, it, it was only after I became a parent looking back on it that I was like, Oh yeah, this is, this is extremely fucked up. And I think like, Oh, if I did this to my child, that would be, you know, I couldn't live with myself. So it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, that, that's all the kind of stuff that's, that I'm dealing with in at least that part of the book. It's like being a fish in water, right? We just take all these things for granted until we finally get some sort of opportunity to look from the outside in on them because they seem yeah. normal. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, I know, you know, there have been autobiographical elements in, in eight ball, you know, some of the shorter stories, um, yeah, but but again, you know, this that that specifically being such an interesting story. Um and obviously you're you're not a memoirist. You know, a lot of your contemporaries are. Um is it when it comes to sort of dealing with these things and and answering these questions uh as you were talking about before and and processing, is it is it easier to process them indirectly? Yeah, I don't I don't want to be the main character. I don't feel uh, I don't, I don't feel like I could be honest as a main character. Mm. I have to write about somebody else that I can, that I can be honest through about them and through them. You know, I just feel like I would not, I don't want to have to be put in the position of thinking like, well, this makes me look bad or this makes me, this seems like I'm trying to make myself look good. You know, those kind of questions I think are really hampering. And I'm much more, I, I like the idea of, of that you can make up uh, parts that are more interesting than, than the mundane parts that are, you know, make up the, the part of your life that, you know, like the parts, like when you tell a story a hundred times, it gets more and more interesting. You learn like, oh, I'm going to cut out that part. That's not how he responds to that. And I'm going to like merge these characters together because nobody understands that, you know, and you learn to, tell the story in this very concise way, but you, by the end, it's not exactly the truth. It's sort of the, the reason for telling the story is the truth, but the, the facts don't all add up. You know, and I, I feel very, I feel, especially nowadays, you have to be um, considerate of the truth. You know, I think the truth is, is permeable in, in a way it never has been. And so I don't, I don't want to identify something as the truth when it's not. That's something I might have done when I was younger. I might have fucked around with the idea of the truth and like this is the true story, and then changed. It. But I don't. I don't think that's uh, ethical at the moment. In terms of in terms of passing something off as a true story, yeah, it just feels uh, it feels like that's what the world is doing right now, and so you know that so much of the world. And I, don't, I think uh, I don't want to be a part of that. I think surrealism is an interesting approach to some of this and there were there were segments one one in particular that really reminded me more of a velvet glove than probably anything you've written that i've read since then um which i really appreciate i mean that that is that's one of my favorite books of yours and it was really nice seeing you operate in that again i always want to get get back into that world but the stories i find myself interested in don't don't lend themselves to that so i was really happy to sort of find a, a end run, a way to get back into it without kind of screwing up what I was trying to do overall. Is that, is that a method for processing reality? Yeah, that's sort of, that's, uh, that's, you know, the sort of the dream version of reality, which I often think is, is more real than the real version. You know, that's dreams tell the truth. You know, it's, uh, there's no filtering, you know, I, I, uh, I think that's uh, I think that's a really interesting way to kind of figure out what you really think is to sort of look at not necessarily dream Im imagery, but the kind of things that 
that float through your head that strike you as like that's that's unreal and yet feels more real than real i mean it also brings us back to what we were talking about earlier that it is a way it it took me way i i understood this way too late in life but the the importance of uh of symbolism and metaphor as these tools to say something that you can't say in words and this seems like perhaps a way into that yeah there's um I tried to I tried to uh, sort of keep have the imagery. I, I wanted the imagery in the book to kind of tell tell a story that sometimes matches the words, but sometimes kind of deviates from the words, and that it's it's telling something that's not as as explicit as the words. I don't I, I can't describe it exactly, but I did I I had this. I had this sense of, of sort of reading it without, without reading the words, you know, just reading it visually and what, it, you know, what story is that telling as opposed to then when you add the layer of putting the words on top of that, what is, what, how does that change it? And so it was a lot about that kind of visual sim- symbolism that's, that's permeating the whole book. And I tried to put a lot of thought into that, the patterns and the repetitions and things like that. Things that are in a certain sense established in that sequence are, are to be found throughout the book. Yeah. And, and even, even, you know, the elements of the, the sort of jokey uh, spread that takes us through all, you know, the history of life on earth up to the, to the beginning of, I wanted the you know all of those to kind of resonate and to make you I want I want the reader to think about like uh is this me or her telling this story and is it and when is she telling each part of the story and I think there's a lot uh there's a lot in there that kept me interested in trying to like think think through that When you say me you mean Dan me, yeah. Is it me? Am, is this my story? Am I am I telling each of these stories, or is she telling them? Like, whose whose voice are we really hearing? Even the cover, you know, is that me showing her, or is that her showing her? Uh, do you know the answer to that question? Um, you know, I have my thoughts, but it's not my my answer isn't necessarily the right one. Yeah, it's not something I thought through in in advance. You know, uh, you know, and I, I want to sort of talk about this in a way that doesn't give too much away. I, you know, I know that you were very cognizant of that earlier. Of, of all the books I've ever done, I feel like this is the one I want people to know the least about. Because I think, I think you really, just judging from the first, you know, 20 responses, people really don't have any idea. what's what, And I think that that's what I love. You know, when, so when, when I when I like, I see the new Scorsese movie has a trailer and I was like, I'm not watching a second of that, you know, and I know a little bit about the story, but I don't want to know anything. I don't know what it looks like or anything. I want to walk into the theater and see it and not know anything. I think it's funny that as you're, you know, obviously you've been in and around movies for, you know, at least like 20 years at this point, right? Uh, Ghost World was more than that. Yeah. 25. yeah. Ghost World was like 2002, I think. Yeah. We started writing, Ghost World in 97, I think. I I bring it up because in a funny way, although there are like, there are um, elements of, um, what's his name? Uh, Kaufman, not Andy Kaufman, the uh, Charlie Kaufman in in there, you know, towards the end, right? You've got a little bit of of the kind of the adaptation. A little bit. The the whole point of adaptation, why I bring this up, the whole point of adaptation is like, how, how do you film the unfilmable source material? And in a funny way, this... This is one of your most unfilmable books. It'd be difficult. <laughs> It'd be difficult. All these, you know, you. This is the time when the most interest in from Hollywood happens when nobody's seen the book. Everybody's like, "I want it. I'll buy it." And uh, and I was like, "Yeah, you might want to wait. You might want to wait." More. You've been doing this for a long time. You're you're established. I, I you know I know, but like. The basic, I mean, you're the, the two projects right now, the film projects are kind of in limbo at the moment. Is that right? The Writers Guild certainly has kept it 
Oh yeah, no, none of my none of my things. I I just become so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I just have become where I don't like I, you know, I'm not interested unless it's going to be great. You know, I'm, I don't I don't want a mediocre movie made. Any you know, it's just not. There's no joy in it. What are your feelings on Wilson? That's it. It you know it. It wasn't my book, you know, it came out, it was very different. What I, what I wrote, the characters, you know, it's all great actors. It, it's its own thing, but it's just not my thing. And it just, uh, there's almost not a single line of dialogue in the movie that I actually wrote. It's all slightly tweaked and improv. And it just, it doesn't feel like anything I had anything to do with. At, by the end, you know, I don't even recognize it to some degree. And so it's, you know, that's what happens. And there's just no, no happiness in that. Unless you're working with Terry, which sounds, sounds like a very collaborative. Yeah, Terry and I, yeah, we got, to, at least we had a great time working together and we got to make, we got to make the movies we wanted for the most part. And so I'm happy with both of those, but I don't want to ever, lose control again, unless it's to, you know, somebody who's better than I am at, at art, you know, make at making whatever they're going to make. Scorsese changed your dialogue. That would be fine. He could, he's yeah, absolutely. People always wonder after your last book, like you, and I'm saying this about you specifically, you know, whether there's going to be another book, yeah. how long did this take yeah. beginning to end? It's really, six years of work i've followed you since uh, you know i i was i was in high school and, and you know the in in over the last like decade in particular i've always wondered like you know is he is he still gonna keep making comics it's never felt like a certainty for me is it is it a certainty for you that oh, you're yeah. gonna keep doing this uh, it's the only thing i really like doing i haven't really done much movie stuff during this whole book really I got, I got very burned. I had a great time doing that. And it was, I think it was really essential to have this little thing that I could kind of get away from comics from. I was feeling a little claustrophobic in comics and to get away from it and then come back to it with, with a real sense of like having learned new stuff and to be gone through these experiences that were kind of useful mentally, but also to be, uh, just to be refocused on what it is that's actually enjoyable about comics. And I, I have to say this patience to some degree was, was this way, although uh, because it was all drawn in one style, I got kind of burned out by the end, but this book was, was so joyful and like emotionally gratifying to work on that. I did not want it to end. And I really think I probably took two, two more years than I needed to just to just milking every second out of it to making the tiniest little changes, you know, doing obsessive stuff, but I'm glad I did. It, I feel like, um, like I did, I did what I set out to do. You bring up an interesting point, you know, in a book that is so much tied to, or at least from the outset was tied to this idea of, of doing different genres, you know, like it, it is, it's a war story at one point that seems like it would lend itself well to switching styles. Yeah, that was the idea. You know, you you set out to do uh, to do a certain style, and then you, you write the story, and you realize, oh, this you know, this might have been written as something I intended as like a horror story, but it doesn't matter. That style wouldn't quite work for it. I mean, I, if if I were to sit and go through the book page by page, I could tell you what I was going for. I, I find that's the, my best way to work is to go. Like, okay, I'm going to do a Joe Orlando story and wh whatever that means to me. And some, I don't like sit and look at Joe Orlando. I just have it in my mind. I'm going to do, I'm going to do this kind of drawing in it and it seeps into the drawing and it, it's, uh, it, it gives me, uh, sort of a cohesion for the way I want it to look, but everything is filtered through that. It's some artist that you probably would never in a million years figure out in <laughs> you know again again getting back to that wap piece and i keep harping on it because it's the one thing out there about this book the which only, is not do out 
for several months. You know, he he talks about the in memoriam, and obviously we talked about you know losing your mother, losing your brother, but um, I I think he sort of discusses it from the angle that like that that's a huge part of the book, and and that's a big part of the book turning out the way it turned out are the people yeah. who were lost during it. Yeah, I mean, my basically all remaining members of my family are gone. Um, you know, except for my wife and son and, uh, and, but losing my two friends was, was much, uh, much more devastating. My friend, Richard Sala and Gary Lee, um, that was, that's still really hard to process. And it's, um, and part of that, part of the loss, especially Richard, who I saw every week and was a close friend for 25 years, he, he was the only person I had to talk to about certain things. You know, you have certain friends who just, he's the guy who I talk to about this. And, you know, when you're, when something happens and you get your phone, I got to text somebody, you know, oh, this is for him. And he was, he was a huge part of that. And, uh, and so this book is in many ways talking to him, you know, it's through, it's, filtered through a lot of the stuff he was interested in. And a lot of it I kind of tweaked in terms of like Richard would like this, you know, I'm sort of imagining him because he, he was such a great reader of my books. You know, he would, every time one came out, he'd write a long email the day after it came out and he'd always say stuff that nobody else said. It was so brilliant. And so exactly what I wanted to hear um, and he wasn't just trying to be nice. I mean, he was very nice about it. He would never say a mean word, but, but it was, uh, but it was always so he had such an interesting take on it. And so this, a lot of this book is like for, for him to enjoy in a, in a weird way. Well, he was a big genre guy too. So that makes That's a lot of thing. sense. He knew all these genres so well, and he knew all the, he was, uh, I, at a certain point, uh, what kind of word got around through me that, um, that if you needed to figure out a movie, like if you were like, okay, there's a movie with Dan Duryea and he, and he's got an eye patch. What, and I saw it on TV in 1965. What is it? And it's like, I would just ask Richard and he'd go, Oh, that's, you know, one eyed Calhoun, 1954. You know, he would know that he would just immediately know it. And so, even like kind of big deal Hollywood people that I've met would write to me and like, can you ask your friend Richard if he can figure this out? And always he would do it. And so, uh, and so he, it's definitely, you know, I put in little, little characters in the background that I just thought, well, he's the only one who would have appreciated that. The RSDB, the Richard Sala database. Yeah, exactly. I know it's an incredible loss. Just that. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it, I got, this is going to be, this is going to sound morbid. It kind of is, but it, it's, it's that thing of like, it was actually, I think Adrian Tomina was the first person to, to, to tell me this, um, you know, about, and I think everybody does this to a certain extent, but it's, you know, sort of like quantifying how many books you have left in you, you know, if it takes you four years or six years or, or however long, but an element of that is that, you know, as you get older and then as it takes six years to do a book, like, I mean, you're going to lose people in that time. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in cartoon, you know, it's, I know what do they say? Like being a lumberjack is the most dangerous job. You know, <laughs> next is a EMT or something, but I would think cartoonist is high up there. Cause it's just like the most sedentary lifestyle. You know, you see Al Jaffe and a few others live in cartoon too. But most of them don't last that long. Um, so it's, yeah, you do have to wonder, you know, how, and, and you look at the history of, you know, I, I spent a lot of time when I turned 60, I'd go, okay, what is, what, what are all my favorite artists? What were they doing at 60? And a lot of them are just completely finished. You know, like some of them are just still going gangbuster. You know, you look at Hitchcock at 60. Made his three best movies possibly, but then you look at uh, you look at some artists and they're just calcified in there. They're doing their daily strip or whatever, and it's 
kind of joyless and so it's so you have to think like how long how long can my brain function on the level it takes to to do this so you i'm glad i did this book because i feel like i did you know i did one that was at at sort of the top of my powers and then you know who knows what's next i'll be doing i was like willem de kooning alzheimer's paintings or something you know? <laughs> jesus yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's your brain and your hands. It's obviously a big part yeah. of it too. Yeah. Luckily I'm physically quite, you know, fine. Like I don't have hand pain or back pain like most people, but, um, but you just never know. I mean, I've got plans. I've got plans for more books, but, uh, you know, I, I realize it's probably, I'm not going to do five more long books. I don't know what I'll do. You know, I may do short books, but, but you never know. Scorsese is an example for us going back to him. Uh, did you see that quote from him recently where he's yeah. talking about Kurosawa? Yeah. Wonderful quote. Yeah. But I mean, that really kind of gets right in your guts that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, and I do feel that I feel like I have more, more uh, like more abilities and more uh, just like a more vast kind of knowledge of what I'm doing and could do than I ever did. But it's that awareness too of like uh, part part of the trouble when you get old is you filter out so much stuff. When you're younger, you're like, oh, "That's a great idea, I'll do that." And when you're older, you know, like, eh, "That's kind of a stupid idea. <laughs> that's not going to work." And so you don't you don't follow impulses as much. You you have to really wait and see, like, "Yeah, I gotta I gotta wait for something that's actually worth." doing and that waiting is what kills you it occurred to me as you were talking and this will actually bring us around to the beginning in a nice way but it occurred to me as you were talking about you know the story with your your parents and and how that was isolating and how that was the beginning of you know what what to a certain extent has been an isolating life i mean it strikes me that probably right around the same time or not long after that you went into an incredibly isolating profession for good, for that reason, because I felt comfortable. I, I remember uh, one of the greatest impetuses for for like becoming a cartoonist and like working twelve to fourteen hours a day when I was young was like I can't function in a, in a job around other people. Like I knew it was like I had severe anxiety and social issues about stuff like that that I knew would like I was going to do whatever it took to avoid it. And I think I really like, I felt great pressure of like, I gotta, I gotta be able to do this. <laughs> this is comfortable for me. You're a one man production to a certain extent. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that about it. I love that, that idea that uh, I have so many friends who are filmmakers and they're like, I can't, I can't do the movie I want. Cause they, they only want to give me 18 grand and I need 24, you know? And I think like, yeah, I don't, I could do it ever. I could do like vast, you know, rolling battle if I want, and it doesn't cost me a nickel. <laughs>